the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue through this important and penitential season of Lent, we are again pointed to the hard truth that our world is broken by sin. This brokenness can be found all around us and also within us. We as fallen human beings are quick to judge others and justify ourselves. We follow our hearts in many ways throughout the day, and yet the scriptures teach us there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. But the broken state of the world is something we use as an excuse for why we look to elevate our own thoughts, words, and actions to the point of the way that we think, speak, or act is not hurtful or selfish, or sinful. Well, Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, came into our flesh and into the world that we broke because it needed to be redeemed. He came here in love, which is what prompted his Father to create us and sustain our lives for every day he gives us. And he sends his Spirit to create and sustain the faith that saves us in our hearts. And as we wake our way through the season of Lent, as we examine our text for this morning, you might wonder, how many miracles did Jesus offer to people in need during his earthly life? How many kind and gentle interactions did he offer to those whom he encountered? How many times did he show humility, setting aside his divine authority in order to share his love? And how likely is it that his interaction in the Holy Gospel this morning would get him into major cultural trouble if it happened to a public figure today? Well, I'm guessing that if we all took a blank sheet of paper in just a couple of minutes to write down the first few descriptions of Jesus that came into our minds with all of the accounts provided for us in the New Testament, I'm guessing all of it would be positive, uplifting, and loving. And all of that would be true. But the way that this world works, and even though we all fall victim to its influence, I don't think any one of us here would take that blank sheet of paper and write down to describe Jesus insult-dealing, anti-feminist, woman-hating, misogynist. I don't think we'd do it. And this is because we, who have been shaped by the whole of Holy Scripture, whose minds are molded by the Holy Spirit, we know that Jesus stepped onto this planet to redeem all people, including those who would also attempt to apply such labels on him. And yet his words to a woman in need, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. He spoke these words to a woman as she was pleading with him for a miracle. So did she just catch him at a bad time? Matthew sets the scene. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. The problem Jesus is presented with is quite serious. This woman loves her daughter dearly, as every mother should, and she rightly trusts that Jesus can bring an immediate solution. She addresses him as the son of David. Points, this points to a faith worked in her heart through the word of God. But he did not answer her a word. He ignored her. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. They wanted her removed from their presence. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Cultural expectations vary over time and in different parts of the world. We know this. In Jesus' day, rabbis or religious teachers instructed men only, and men went home to instruct their wives and children in the faith. 
This follows the order of creation as laid out for us when God created man and then woman. And remember last week's Old Testament lesson, which recorded for us the aftermath of man's fall into sin. Among the explanations, God tells Eve, the wife, that she would have a desire for her husband. This means she would want to be in charge over him. But God said that he would rule over her. And when this is properly applied through the lens of husbandly, fatherly, sacrificial love, it is both true and fitting, and it is a relief to everyone involved. It is truly the best way forward for a marriage and for a home. But many cowardly, insecure, and selfish men fall short of offering this love. And instead, they follow this world's example of seeking after one's own wants before the wants or even needs of their wives and children under their care. Well, Jesus Christ stands against such a way of living, and he sets a wonderful example for all husbands and fathers, even in this strange interaction with this Canaanite woman. The fact that he did not initially offer her a response does stand out as a bit peculiar. As he references the lost sheep of Israel, he is testing this woman, knowing that she is a Canaanite, but also his disciples. And the disciples seem convinced, but she's not giving up. She came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. She knows that the problem her daughter is facing is too great for her to resolve. And despite this initial test, she refuses to leave Jesus' presence. She even kneels before him, pointing to the holiness that she knows is in him. And the same is done here at the altar by so many of you. Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper at this rail, as we come into the holy presence of Jesus Christ himself. And so after seeing this, Jesus offers her these words. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. At this point, Jesus appears quite clearly to be comparing this woman in desperate need to a dog. And what reaction would he receive in our culture today? He called this woman a dog? No one should ever listen to him again. No one should follow him. And anyone who does is at the very least a sexist. Well, rather than turning away and finding offense, this woman unceasingly looks to Jesus in faith. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. To understand this response, we must understand both the severity of sin and also the wickedness of this world and its ways. She understood both. And her words and her actions, her reactions, prove this. By asking specifically for mercy, she acknowledges that she is not worthy of Jesus' time or attention or concern or energy. And as Christians, we know that regardless of who we are or where we come from, the same is true for each of us. It's true for all sinful people. To ask for mercy is to ask to be released from a deserved punishment. She holds no delusions that Jesus owes her anything. But at the same time, she knows that he loves her. This world has no love in itself apart from God. And this world does not know forgiveness or mercy. And in fact, it refuses its need for forgiveness and furthermore, refuses to forgive. Anyone who follows this pattern follows this world and will not be forgiven. Well, this woman will not stop in her request, and out of love, Jesus puts a stop to his test. He hears her words and says, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed immediately. He commends her faith, and he immediately heals her daughter. And he offers each of us this same relief as he meets us here each week in the divine service. And this right here is what we need to go forward to love our neighbor, 
And this right here in this space is where we receive his mercy to lovingly share. This is where he gives us his forgiveness, which he won for each of us and all the world at the cross. Though he came for the lost children of Israel, we know that he came for every single human being, male and female. And the miracle he offers in our reading proves the love he has for this woman and for her daughter. The empty cultural labels or recently coined phrases that worldly-minded people today would most certainly place on Jesus for how he interacts with and tests this woman, they all fall flat when examining the full context of who he is and what he is doing with her specifically. In fact, he shows here that his focus is on the biggest problem she is facing, not on her as a woman or a mother or a Canaanite or even her dear demoniac daughter's dire condition, but as a sinner, which we all share with her. His love and forgiveness comes to all who see their sin and confess it and turn from it and believe in him as the son of David. We do this only by his grace and undeserved gift. It comes to us through his work alone. He took on a human body to redeem each of ours and to lovingly bring us a relief that this world cannot offer. He went through death and the grave, laying down his perfect life for the sins of all humanity. They placed his dead body in a tomb, and three days later, he rose again, coming, not coincidentally enough, first into contact with a number of women who had followed him by faith. Well, the Canaanite woman in our text shows us a perfect picture of faith founded in God's word a faith that results in forgiveness and looks to its only source, Jesus Christ, as the solution to sin stain in both body and soul. Regardless of the role society puts on us, based upon our bodies or any familial background, or whatever other labels this world might try to stick to us, Jesus tested this woman's faith to show her the brokenness of her sin, and she acknowledged it rather than taking offense or retaliating. But taking offense as an excuse to not do something we don't already want to do is an easy and worldly approach. If we want to find offense at God's good law, his call to trust him, to pray to him, and to hear him through his word each day and here in worship each week, our sinful flesh can find offense with that. If we want to be offended by the protections he offers, the important office of parent and all other authorities, over his gifts of life and marriage and personal property and the truth and a good reputation, we will be offended. If we want to take any portion of God's word, including that difficult passage that shows us that the wages of sin is death, well, if we want to do that and claim that it violates our deeply held personal beliefs, we will instead embrace the same mindset as those who would decry Jesus for his conversation with this Canaanite woman. And if we do that, we look past the beauty that he comes not only to caution us about our sinful state, but to rescue us from it, just as he did with her daughter, as he met her request for relief. Like this woman, all believers look first to Christ and to the mercy and grace that he freely shares with us by his word and through his spirit. And then we share it unceasingly in our words and our actions, which should be a reflection of this love with all those around us. Forgiving as we have first been forgiven and living out our chief vocation. No matter who you are, the most important part of who you are is baptized child of God one who sees sin and turns from it, confesses it, repents of it. Well, to the world, the love that God gives us in holy baptism is unknown. And rather than pointing to this curious interaction as a reason to turn away from Jesus Christ and his word or to take offense with him or anything in the scriptures, we can use our lives to point the world to what he truly shows us here. His sacrificial love for sinners and his willingness to save us all through his life, death, and resurrection.
Amen.